You may remember a video I uploaded two years ago, in which I narrated nine Butterfly Effect stories. I figured it was time for a sequel. The Butterfly Effect. Something that we perceive as trivial or insignificant at any given time might actually be the catalyst that sets into motion a series of events that drastically alters our lives. The following are personal accounts from people who have had their own butterfly effect experiences. I was an underwater welder for almost a decade in the 90s. The job involved getting sent down to the bottom of the ocean, usually to repair damaged pipelines. Occasionally we'd work on oil rigs too, sometimes dams in the underbellies of ships. The pay was amazing, but you can probably guess why. Underwater welding was one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. Still is. The mortality rate is something like 40 times the national average. When you're working as an underwater welder, you have to be extremely careful. Things can go sour very quickly if you're not concentrating. The job comes with a whole plethora of risks. Decompression sickness, electrocution, drowning, getting crushed, cognitive problems, you name it. The scariest, however, is Delta P. Essentially, it's when two bodies of water have dramatically different pressures. If a diver happens to be near an open valve when Delta P is in effect, it'll suck them up. What makes it so scary is that there's almost no way of sensing it until it's too late. You can't see it, you can't feel it, but once it grabs you, that's your lot. Here's a video that shows how it works on an unsuspecting crab. Maybe you've even heard of the Dolphin Bell incident, where a guy got sucked through a small hole no more than the size of a clock face, expelling all his organs in the process. That was Delta P. Now that I've painted that beautiful picture, on with my story. At the time, I was working in the Gulf of Mexico. I was tasked with going down to the depths and clearing a blockage. Should have been pretty routine, something I could have easily done by myself. Instead, I got paired up with a newbie. The company wanted to get him more experienced. The newbie was a pretty nice guy. I talked with him a bit before we got in the water, asked him what made him choose this line of work. He said, pure chance. He'd been studying business at university, and planned to go down that route with his life. During one of his tests, however, he came to a question that was 50-50. Not knowing what answer to pick, he flipped a coin. Turns out, the coin betrayed him, and gave him the wrong answer. He failed that test by one point, and ended up getting kicked out of school. With nothing but diving experience under his belt, he figured he'd start a lucrative career in commercial diving. We're in the water at this point, and the newbie goes off ahead to clear the blockage, while I keep an eye on him and examine some of the pipeline down there. Once he unclogged the blockage, something went horribly wrong. An unexpected, powerful surge of Delta P took a hold of him. It sucked him deep inside the pipe. Like, completely inside. We rush to shut off the right valves and get the pressure back under control, to get in there and try get the newbie out. We needn't have bothered. We already knew it was too late. I was sent in to retrieve the guy's body. His wasn't the first I'd had to retrieve in my career, but it was the last. Once my contract expired, I quit. I'd been faced with the death of colleagues a couple of times in the past but I'd never come that close to losing my own life. I still get the occasional flashback of that incident popping into my head from time to time. It's only pure dumb chance that that newbie got sucked into the pipework instead of me. Hell, he wasn't even supposed to be there in the first place. It terrifies me to think about how that coin flip decided which one of us would live and which would die. Anyway, that's my tale. 
Trust me, every diver has at least 10 crazy stories, half of which involve them almost dying. If you ever thought about getting into this line of work, I seriously suggest you reconsider. My brother was going to a concert in Indianapolis to see Metallica. His buds pulled up outside to pick him up, and he quickly goes to throw on his Metallica t-shirt. Annoyingly, he couldn't find it. Not wanting to keep his pals waiting, he just throws on a Nirvana shirt instead, not really giving it too much thought. The guys drive down to the stadium and have a whale of a time rocking out to their favourite tracks. While there, some random chick in the crowd comes up to my brother and comments on his Nirvana shirt, saying how overrated that band was. It didn't seem like she was coming over to flirt or anything. It was just something that came to her mind because she was a bit tipsy. My brother thought she was quite attractive, so he replies with the old, no way, he must have hearing damage line. A line so lame, it wouldn't usually work. But in this case, she seemed pretty receptive. They hang around for the rest of the show, and afterwards, my brother decides to hang out with her for a bit longer. He tells his friends to drive back without him, says that he'll grab a cab later back to his place. They say their goodbyes, and they drive off. He chills with this girl for a while, and they hit it off pretty well. They both agree to stay in contact, and my brother calls it a night and dials up for a cab. Later that night, he hears the news. His friends were involved in a major collision on their way back from the show. The crash was so bad that the only thing left of one of his buddies was basically a red skid mark on the road. All three of them lost their lives. The empty seat my brother would have been sitting in had pieces of sharp metal piercing it from all directions. He would have been annihilated. My brother managed to escape his fate, all because he randomly threw on that Nirvana shirt from the drawer. He found his Metallica shirt a few days later, hanging in the closet in plain view. My uncle was a tunnel rat in the Vietnam War. Basically, the Viet Cong had a huge underground system of complexes all over the place. When American troops found one of their tunnels, they'd send a few soldiers in to flush out any enemy troops. It was usually the shorter guys in the squad who had to perform this horrible task. Unfortunately for my uncle, he was five foot five. Since these tunnels were usually super confined, a rifle was pretty much useless. The only things they brought inside with them were a pistol, a bayonet, and a flashlight. On the day of this incident, my uncle and his platoon uncovered one of these tunnels. He gets nominated to go inside with another guy as backup. In a way, they were lucky. Half the time, you had to crawl your way through the tunnels on your stomach. This time, they had just enough room to make their way through on their feet, albeit extremely hunched over. Regardless, you can imagine how they felt going in. The VC had the home ground advantage, knew the tunnels like the back of their hand, and most likely had booby traps set up all the way through the tunnel. My uncle and his buddy were moving through the tunnel single file, Adrenaline, darkness, and lack of oxygen screwing with their vision and their minds. They're deep into the complex when they come to a fork in the path. One path leads off to the left, the other to the right. Time to split up. They decided to rock, paper, scissors to see who would go left. My uncle knew what he was going to choose right away. Paper. This is where the butterfly effect comes in. The day prior, at mealtime, he had the choice of sitting with one of two groups of guys. His usual buds, or a couple of guys he hadn't talked to that much at this point. My uncle always had a thing for the larger lady. He had gotten into an argument with one of his pals about a picture of his girl. One of the fellas made an inappropriate joke about the picture. 
This led to a falling out. As such, my uncle sat with these other guys. While they're talking, one of the dudes brings up a little fact that my uncle finds kind of interesting. He tells him that in rock, paper, scissors, people are statistically more likely to open with rock. This pops into my uncle's head as he and his fellow tunnel rat are about to shoot. He goes with paper, and sure enough, the other guy goes with rock. The numbers game worked. As such, my uncle goes off to the left, and his partner heads right. My uncle makes his way through, and twenty minutes feels like an eternity. Luckily for him, he doesn't come face to face with Charlie or any of his traps. He plants some C4 on the structural weak points to collapse the tunnel. Then, he gets the hell out of there. When he resurfaces, his platoon leader gives him a pat on the shoulder. Now, they just had to wait for the other guy to get back out. The other guy never did make it out. On the right side, the VC were hiding in concealed cracks in the wall. When the unsuspecting private made his way past them, they impaled him with spears. There's no way he could have seen them waiting for him to come by. So, there you have it. The fact my uncle prefers larger ladies and likes statistics may have saved his life. Since hearing that story, I always go with paper first. My great-grandfather was aboard the Titanic. He was in third class, and intended to go with the cruise ship for the entirety of its maiden voyage. However, he fell sick right before they reached Belfast. Belfast. The last stop before the Titanic's fateful sail across the Atlantic. My great-grandfather didn't think he was that sick, but was forced to go ashore anyway, as they didn't want the cold to spread. If he hadn't gotten sick, he would have been on board in third class when the iceberg hit, leading to almost certain death. My family says that when he found out about the ship sinking in the newspaper, he fell to his knees in the middle of the streets, crying and praying. Honestly, who would do anything else? I've also had a butterfly effect. About three years ago, I was buying some groceries. When I was at the counter, I decided to buy a lottery ticket. It was at this moment that a man behind me, who I assumed was drunk, walked up beside me and shouted, Hey, me too. The woman at the counter and him started to argue. She gave up and just gave him a ticket to make him go away. Then, she gave me mine. Outside the shop, the same man tried to hit me, causing me to drop my groceries and my ticket. He also fell over and dropped his. I went to pick up mine, but he grabbed it. I wasn't so fussed and didn't want to anger him further, so I just grabbed his that he left behind. That ticket I grabbed won me half a million pounds. My family originally comes from Russia. Here's a tale that's been passed down to me. As you're probably aware, things were harsh for Russians under Stalin's leadership. My granddad was a critic of the Man of Steel, and as a result, he found himself imprisoned in a Siberian gulag for being a so-called enemy of the community. His sentence? Ten years hard labor. For many, this might as well have been a death sentence. Millions died in these camps due to the freezing cold temperatures, rampant disease, lack of food, and just generally being overworked to the point of collapse. My granddad was a hardy fellow though. He knew that if he put his mind to it, he'd survive. According to him, life in the camp was brutal. Violence amongst the prisoners was commonplace. They'd compete for warmth, cigarettes, and everything in between. 
a true friend was hard to come by. Plenty of inmates became informers, just waiting to tell the guards about anything that might land them an extra chunk of bread. During his time at the camp, my granddad saw many people try to escape. Most were shot within the first minute of their attempt. The guards always aimed to kill. If an inmate escaped on their watch, they'd often be stripped of their uniforms and ran the risk of becoming an inmate themselves. Those escapees who managed to avoid getting gunned down rarely made it very far. The cold Siberian weather killed most of those poor bastards off. Their bodies were usually found a few kilometers away from the camp. Running was almost guaranteed suicide. Almost. Each day, my granddad and his fellow inmates spent 12 hours cutting and stacking logs. They were running on barely any food. The more timber you cut, the more food you were given. Inevitably, the weak were starving and occasionally would steal another inmate's bread. The guards didn't bother to punish anyone who stole food. No, they left that to the other inmates. It was an unwritten rule. Anyone that was caught stealing bread was sentenced to death. The other workers would simply wait for the guards to avert their eyes. Then they'd take their axes, and the thief would end up having an accident. It was a code that all the inmates lived by. So, when my granddad caught a young lad eating some of his bread one day, you can imagine how sickened he felt. He was the only witness, but his word would have been good enough to condemn the boy. Instead, my grandfather decided to show him mercy. The lad was one of his bunkmates, and he wanted to give him a second chance. My granddad decided to keep his mouth shut, but made the boy promise never to steal again. This was going to be his one warning. The boy thanked my grandfather, and promised him that he'd never touch anyone else's food as long as he was in the camp. One night, a few months later, my grandfather awoke to find the young man nudging him. He urged my grandfather to follow him out into the yard. Delirious with tardness and hunger, my grandfather did as the young man asked. The pair of them crept their way to a nearby shelter, and watched as a group of guards entered their bunkhouse. As it turns out, several of my grandfather's bunkmates had been planning an escape. When the guards got word of this, they decided to hold the whole bunkhouse responsible. The guards rounded up all ten men inside, and marched them out into the freezing cold tundra in the middle of the night. They never returned to camp. He doesn't know if they froze to death, or if they were shot. Whatever the case, my grandfather would have shared in their fate, had it not been for the actions of the young man. You see, the young man had become friendly with a few of the guards in an effort to score some extra food. They found him endearing enough to keep alive, so, when they heard that some of his bunkmates were planning a breakout, they warned him to stay out of the shack at a certain time. Knowing what they meant, the lad remembered the act of mercy my grandfather had showed him, and decided it was time to repay his debt. A life for a life. He may have been a thief, but there was still some honor left in him. Whether you want to call it the butterfly effect, or luck, or coincidence, or whatever, the fact that my grandfather spared that boy is the only reason he survived his time in the Gulag. Hell, it's the only reason I even exist in the first place. My grandfather fought in World War II and was stationed in the Pacific. Once, when waiting in line to get on a transport plane, he was cut in front of by a man as he was about to board the plane. The guy who cut in front of him took the last spot on the flight, and my grandpa was screwed out of getting on. The next transport didn't leave until the next day, so my grandpa was pissed. He bitched to the guy about it, but he was outranked, so he had to let the guy take his spot. 
turns out that that plane was shot down and everyone on board was killed. I wouldn't exist if it wasn't for my grandma wearing a yellow sweater. My grandparents worked in the same building for several years, and my grandpa would always walk right past my grandma on his way to the office. One day, my grandma decided to wear a yellow sweater to work. That day, it just so happened to catch his eye. He immediately proceeded to ask my grandma out. They've been together ever since. She was planning on quitting her job in the next two weeks, so there's a good chance that he never would have even noticed her or met her if she hadn't worn that sweater. His name was Fleming, and he was a poor Scottish farmer. One day, while trying to eke out a living for his family, he heard a cry for help coming from a nearby bog. He dropped his tools and ran to the bog. There, mired to his waist in black mulch, was a terrified boy, screaming and struggling to free himself. Farmer Fleming saved the lad from what could have been a slow and terrifying death. The next day, a fancy carriage pulled up to the Scotsman's house. An elegantly dressed nobleman stepped out and introduced himself as the father of the boy that Farmer Fleming had saved. I want to repay you, said the nobleman. You saved my son's life. No, I can't accept payment for what I did, the Scottish farmer replied, waving off the offer. At that moment, the farmer's own son came to the door of the family hovel. Is this your son? the nobleman asked. Yes, the farmer replied proudly. I'll make you a deal. Let me take him and give him a good education. If the boy's anything like his father, he will grow up to be a man you can be proud of. And that he did. In time, Farmer Fleming's son graduated from St. Mary's Hospital Medical School in London, and went on to become known throughout the world as the noted Sir Alexander Fleming, the discoverer of penicillin. Years afterwards, the same nobleman's son was stricken with pneumonia. What saved him? Penicillin. The name of the nobleman? Lord Randolph Churchill. His son's name? Winston. Hi guys, Lazy here, and thank you very much for listening. So, butterfly effect stories. Do any of you have your own ones? I'm sure you got a few up your sleeve. Everyone does. Share them down below, I'd be interested in reading them. If you'd like to hear more stories like this, then please also let me know that. And uh, be sure to leave a like and, um, yeah, share the spooky goodness. <laughs> anyway guys, uh, I'll be back very soon with some more videos, so uh, you all hold on tight. Until then. Stay spooky, and remember, the best things happen in the dark.